adventure like KTCA, Sunday, all beginning at 7, here on Channel 2. You're watching member-supported Twin Cities Public Television. KTCA-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2. It takes two. thinkers waiting for another math venture starring Dirk Niblick, eh? Good, because as today's math-curdling episode titled Mall or Nothing at Mall begins, Dirk Niblick of the Math Brigade was catching up on his reading. Oh, this is funny stuff. That Pythagoras certainly knew all the angles. But as luck might have it, Dirk was interrupted by a knock on the door. Gosh darn it, just when I get to the good part about the hypotenuse. I'll get you for that. Hmm, a knocking on the door. It could indicate someone standing on the other side of it. Hello, I was knocking on your door. Yes, I heard you. That's why I opened the door. Ha, it worked. Who are you? I'm a door-to-door -door salesman. But I already have a door. You just knocked on it, remember? Yes, of course. But I'm not selling doors. I'm selling... Batteries. You're a door-to-battery salesman. You should always keep an extra supply of batteries around the house in case of emergencies, so that when the lights go out, you can still play with your toys. You're right. And I do need some. How much are they? This box is 50% off. Special sale price. How many in a box? This box holds a dozen. Batteries normally sell for one dollar. Hmm, sounds like a Jim Dandy deal. A dozen batteries at one dollar each. Let's see, that would be twelve dollars. But, as I mentioned during my sales pitch, if you buy this box, you get a 50% discount. Fifty percent of twelve is one half. Six. Six dollars. Quite a deal, don't you think? I'll say, here you are. But this box is empty. Yes, the batteries are not included. You were trying to cheat me. Go away before I call the authorities. Sore sport. Do you mind if I use your name in future sales presentations? While Dirk returned to his book, in another part of town, Dirk's friends Fluff and Fold Noodleman were about to embark on an adventure on the Sea of Commerce. Fluff and Fold, I wish you luck. Now then, any questions before I go? A couple, Mr. McBurger. You said when we bought this music store franchise from you, we had to make good in a week, or you take the store away from us. Yes, that's one of the beauty parts about our My Ears Are Falling Off music store. If you can't make a go of it, we don't want you to suffer. We just sell the store to someone else. And we get our money back? Ah, that's one of the ugly parts. No, you don't, but I'm sure you'll do quite well. But, Mr. McBurger, what kind of music should we sell from our store? I'm glad you asked me that particular question. I've done some research on that very subject, and I'll be happy to sell it to you for an additional $25,000. Okay, but almost all the money we inherited in another story is gone now. I have asked a sample of people in this town what kind of music they would like to buy, and 98% said they would like cello music. 
cello music. That's right. So if I were you, I'd stock plenty of cello records and tapes. Good idea. They'll sell like hotcakes. Uh, where can we buy cello music? Bring it in, boys. Now we're ready for business. Uh, almost. I also did a second survey and found that two out of three professionals prefer a different kind of music. So maybe you should buy it as well. What kind of music the two out of three professionals surveyed like? Music to float on root canals by. Uh, put it over there, Beacons. Good luck. Well, math fans, so Fluff and Fold are in the music business, eh? I wonder if Dirk knows about this. As a matter of fact, I don't. And it's been six days. Dirk Niblick here. Uh, what? I'll be there in a tick, Fluff. Fluff said she and Fold have been open for business for six days in their new music store and haven't sold one record or one tape. I'll see if I can bring some of my marketing genius to bear. You mean the only kind of music you sell is cello music and root canal music? Uh-huh. Only we haven't sold any. And if we don't make good by tomorrow, we have to give the store back to Mycroft McBurger. And you say Mr. McBurger told you he had done a sampling of your customers and their musical tastes? Yeah, take a look. He interviewed 1,000 people and found out that 98% of them like cello music. That's unusual. He also said two out of three professionals surveyed like root canal music. I see. Let's look at that chart. The survey was done at 13 Long Hair Lane. Perhaps I'd better look into these figures. Okay, Lieutenant, but hurry up because we're going down to shoot. I think I see the error of this survey. No, we don't need numbers to solve this problem, just a little niblick sense. So, Lieutenant Dirk Niblick thinks he has stumbled onto something, does he? But do you know what might be wrong with Mycroft McBurger's survey? Puzzle it out. Use your noodle. We'll be back in just a mite. This is a ball. How many of them are there in this phone booth? That's the question we asked the kids in our studio audience. The one who made the closest estimate will compete today on... Close! Ow! Ow! That's right. It's Close Call, and I'm Reggie Cathy. Now let me introduce to you the host of our show, the man who's tops in our estimation, Mr. Arthur Howard! Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Reggie, and welcome, everybody, to Close Call. Let's meet our contestants. You are? Joel. Joel, and how old are you? Twelve. Twelve, and? Chris. Chris, and how old are you? Twelve. And you are? Awesome. And awesome, answer me this. On the average, can you estimate how many hours a week you talk on the phone? Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> okay. Well, look, we asked everyone in our studio audience for an estimate also. This is <laughs> a ball, and we asked them to estimate how many of these balls are there in this phone booth. Okay, now the actual answer is 253. Now coming closest, and very close indeed, with his estimate of 264 is our fourth contestant, Jamie Schimmel. Is he Jamie? Yeah! <laughs> they know you. Are you uh, surprised that you won? Not really. No. I'm You're pretty good at ball playing. Okay, now, are you ready to play? Yeah. All four of you? Good. Okay, Reggie, I think you're going to help me out this time. Okay. Now, this is something that every household definitely needs. It's a Square One TV balloon popper. This is the pump. The air goes in there into the balloon. And up there is the pin. Now, Reg, would you pump it three times to show the contestant? One, two, three. You notice how much larger it got? Here's our question. How many pumps, how many more pumps will it take for the balloon to burst? That is, to reach the pin. How many more pumps will it take to reach for the balloon to burst? You have 10 seconds to write down your estimates. Reg, have you been practicing your aerobics? You know it. <laughs> OK. Do you write them down? Okay, Joel, what is your estimate? I have six. Six. Chris? Seven. Seven. Oslam? Four. Four. And? Five. 
five. Okay, it's very, very close. Let's find out. Reg, you ready? I'm ready. Let's see. Okay, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, ten. And the winner is Chris with seven. Congratulations. I'm going to wheel you over. <laughs> to here. And look at that two in a second. I want to put you right there. You're going to be in our finals. And to find out who, what is your name again? Chris plays against. I'm going to ask you one more curtain raise. Are you ready? Okay. Um, Cynthia, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Now we're playing hardball. This is a ball of rope, as you can see. There are 100 feet of rope in this ball. Okay. Here's our question. Curtain, please. How many feet of rope did it take to make this ball? You have 10 seconds to write down your estimate. There are 100 feet of rope in this small ball. It's about the size of a soccer ball, wouldn't you say? How many feet are in the larger one? Okay, estimates, please. Contestant number one. I have 10,020. Show the camera. 10,020. And Oslam. 1,488. <laughs> 1,488. Sounds good to me. And? 1,000. 1,000 even. Okay. Now, the actual answer is 5,200 feet, almost a mile. And the winner is, the judges are figuring it out right now, it looks like it's Oslam. Very good. <laughs> our finalists. And the winner of this round is today's champ. Are you ready? Okay. Beverly, would you come out here, please? Yeah. And her two friends. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is the biggest baseball bat I have ever seen. I think we can even come closer. Yeah, what do you think? Close. Okay. Now, would you put your hands right up there like this? Right. Okay. Then you put yours right under Beverly's. Right. Okay. That's one, two. Can you see? Three, four, five, six. Okay, that's six so far. Here's our question. How many hands can be placed side by side along this giant baseball bat? You have set, uh, 10 seconds to write down your estimate. How many hands right side by side can go along this huge baseball bat? What position do you play, Beverly? Catcher. Catcher, okay. Oslam, what's your estimate? 41. 41, and Chris? 26. 26. Okay, well, let's find out. Now, you're going to really have to help me. And if you would, count off with me because it gets confusing. Okay, you're going to keep your hands there, Beverly, yeah, right? Okay. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, count with me. Seven. Seven eight. eight. You now move. Nine. Nine. Ten. Ten. Okay, now you move. <laughs> 12, 12, 12, 13, 13, 13 14, 14, 15, 15, right, wait, 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 15, 16, okay, 17, okay, right side by side, 17, 18, 18, 18 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Square One TV sweatshirts. For our winner, we have a Square One TV sweater. To everyone, congratulations. You were a great audience. Thank you. And see you next time on Close Call. Bye bye. Very good. Congratulations. Stand up. Ask you this, Pilgrim, what times 37 gives you 888? I'm sorry, kids, but a deal is a deal. You haven't made good with your my ears are falling off store, so I'll just have to take it back. He's white, Fluff. A deal's a deal. Yes, but this is not a square deal. This man is trying to separate you from your money substance. He already has. I've done nothing wrong. I'm a businessman, and a deal is a deal. You sold these kids a phony survey. 
Surveys are done all the time in business. They help businessmen know what kind of items to put in their stores. Yes, they are, and surveys are very valuable if they're done right. What is a survey anyway? It's a way of finding out what people think about things, Fluff. And in this case, it used a sample. A sample? Yes, a few pieces to represent the whole. If you want to know what kind of music everyone in town wants to hear, you can't ask all of them. It would take too long. That's right, so I asked a sample of people, and they represent all the people. But your sample was biased. It's not a true picture of the people who live in the town. You wanted these kids to fail so you could take the store back and sell it to someone else. Wait a minute. That would make me a bad person. You mean he asked the wrong people what kind of music they liked? The people McBurger asked are all members of a stringed instrument club. They all play violins and violas and cellos, so naturally, most of them would prefer that kind of music. Sure they would. Then Mr. McBurger sold us cello music. Don't forget about the root canal. Remember, two out of three professional surveys said... How many professional people did you survey, McBurger? Well, I talked to three dentists, and uh, two of them said... Three dentists are not enough to represent all the professionals in the town. You have to ask many more. I want you to give Fluff and Fold their money back and get out of town before it's too late, Mycroft. Why, you... All right, kids, why don't you go out and do your own survey? Only be careful to get a proper sample of the population. Come on, Fold. We'll find out what our customers want to buy. Thanks, Lieutenant. Come by later and we'll lay some sounds on you. I'd rather listen to some music. You know, it's nice to know that common sense has prevailed once again. Now to get comfortable. Ooh, ooh, hurt. Ooh, pain. Ooh, ooh, oh, yeah. And as our hero sinks slowly in his chair, we bid a fond adieu to one of the world's top mathematicians and worst relaxers. Take any number. Okay, 93. Reverse the digits and add them to your first number. Right. Your answer is 132. Now, take that number, reverse the digits, and add them together, and what do you get? A palindrome, ta-da! It reads the same backwards and forwards. Sometimes you have to do it again and again to get a palindrome. Go ahead, go ahead, try some numbers. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. It was Monday, after breakfast, and a tractor-trailer truck had jackknifed on the Hollywood freeway, spilling its load of jackknives all over Tinseltown. Traffic was at a standstill due to flat tires. I was working the day watch out of MathNet. My partner, who usually has to do this, was laid up with a bad knee, which had been put in a cast. Head of our computer division is Debbie Williams. My name is Frankly. I'm a mathematician. Uh-oh. I'd been working on a series of pranks. Someone was pulling on a number of local banks. No money was taken, and no one was hurt. <laughs> Just a little embarrassed. Usually, Kate and I look at scenes from previous episodes to refresh our memories. But Kate knows how to do that, and I don't. Well, I rely on my memory and a little note jotting. Sketching out what you know about a problem is a good way to solve it. I plotted the location of the five banks to see if there was some geographical pattern. But NG, no good. I look for a pattern in the kinds of pranks, because patterns are the essence of mathematics. Again, NG, they seemed unrelated. Get green peppers for meatloaf. I'll do that in Thursday's episode. Then my good old pard, broken wheel and all, found a pattern. She noticed that the first bank had assets about $10 million. The second had assets in the 20 millions. 
the third in the 30s, and so on. It was a pattern, but it didn't seem to mean much on the face of it. Then Debbie called me at Kate's and told me that a sixth bank had been pranked. Again, no money gone. Just a practical joke that sent off the fire alarm sprinkler system and got the customers all wet. That brings us up to date. And it looks like there's a lot more work ahead. A famous investigative reporter named Bernie Woodward had called me and said he might have some information that could shed some light on the bank pranks. I arranged to meet him at his newspaper. Yeah. Mr. Frankly? Right. Parker there. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Your message said you might be able to help me with these bank pranks. Bank pranks? You know, I like a man who can crack Foxy. Yeah, mind if I use that in the paper? Bank pranks? No, I coined it. Uh, and I'd be honored. Done. Mr. Frankly, um, this is a poem that I received. There once was a bank named Last National that installed an alarm, which is rational. It went off with a roar. People ran out the door. What a bad place to trust with your cash and all. It's nice. It's got a good meter, scans well, keeps up rhythmic suspense till the end. Mr. Woodward, I don't know what this poem means. I received it just after the first bank prank. Didn't think anything of it. Top flight investigative reporters like yours truly are always getting weird things in the mail. Uh-huh. But then, I got this one, Mr. Frankly. Another poem? Mm-hmm. A disaster that won't be forgotten was a bank and some eggs that were rotten. The average bank smell made the customers yell and stuff up their noses with cotton. Remember the average bank, the prank there? Someone burned uh, sulfur in the air conditioning system? Right, and gave off the smell of rotten eggs. Right. Have you received any more? Yes, I got one after each prank, but I still didn't put them together. I see. Top-notch, in-depth reporters, like yours truly, are usually busy on other stories. But here's one that I got today, and that's when I decided to call NAFNET. Maybe you can prevent another prank. Farmer's Bank is a place with a sprinkler. It'll put out a fire in a twinkler, but it got people wet, made them fume, made them fret, and withdraw all their cash in a winkler. I think you ought to get over to Farmer's Bank right away and let those it's people know. It's too late. Their sprinkler system went off about an hour ago. Mr. Woodward, please, let me know if you get any more of these. I will. Investigative reporters are very responsible journalists, Mr. Frank. May I take these? Yeah, sure thing. Here are the others. Thirty-five, Kate called. Twelve forty, Kate called. George, Kate called. She sure did. A lot. She asked me to get a list of banks with assets between seventy and eighty million dollars. She says she has an idea about a pattern. I know. I think she's off in a wild chicken chase. Chicken chase. Or a pigeon chase, or ducks, or wild goose chase. Kate's line is busy. Well, when you do talk to her, give her this list, okay? Sure thing, Debbie. Math, not for... Kate, I was just trying to call you, but your line was busy. Anyway, I guess you were trying to call... Yes, I got your message. I got about 500 messages. What's up? What's, what, what's up? Are you okay? George, I just know I've got something in this pattern sequence. Okay, Kate. But I've got sort of a pattern, too. Poems. George, I'm serious. I've asked Debbie to compile. I've got the figures right here. What are they, George? Shoot. Well, let's see. There are more than 1,400 banks and savings institutions in the greater Los Angeles area. 
George, I don't need the history of the Los Angeles financial community. How many banks have assets between 70 and 80 million dollars? Right. According to these figures, there are 247 of them. Is that what you want? George, you've got to stake them out. That's where the next prank will happen. Stake out 247 banks? That's a little impractical, don't you think? Well, then, you've got to call all the managers. And tell them what? Watch out, Mr. Bank Manager. Somebody may put rotten egg gas in your air conditioner or turn on your sprinklers or soap your windows. George, I'm serious. Yes, and you're tired of being laid up. I understand that. George. Kate, I'll come by later and we'll start building your model plane. Won't that be fun? But George. Kate, try and get some rest. Think of this as a forced vacation. Enjoy, enjoy. Talk to you later. Figures, Debbie. Thanks, George. I may have found something interesting. I hope so. I could use something interesting about now. Six banks have been pranked, right? Yep. I've culled some data about them. What are we looking at? A possible motive, I think. Here are the six banks. The first one. Uh huh. Daily deposits are down 18% on the average since the alarm system got stuck and scared the customers. After the rotten egg gas went through the air conditioning system, deposits went down 31%. That's almost a third, business wise. And it goes on off 26%, down 24%. Minus 17%, 19%. After each bank got trashed, their business took a nosedive. If someone is out to hurt these banks, they're succeeding. But who would want to hurt a bank? Right. Williams. Who? I'll tell him, Sam. George, Bernie Woodward is outside. Says he's got a poem? You know what that means? I bet there's been another bank prank. Math, Math, Williams. What? Math, Ned, frankly. Oh, hi, Kate. Are you sure? I'll be right there. George, another bank has been pranked. Look, no time for that now, Debbie. What? Tell Sam and Steve to meet me at Kate's apartment. Her neighbor has a bomb. One hundred percent of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. Yeah, what? This program was made possible.